Dave Williams here, and this video is about conductors, semiconductors, and insulators, and this will be approached for, uh, with a brief overview of atomic theory, tiny bit of quantum physics thrown in. Now the content, the material, and especially the diagrams are all from the fantastic book Lessons in Electric Circuits by Tony Kupalt, specifically Volume 3, Chapter 2. I will include the links that you can see here. I will include those in the video description. Now here is a model of an atom that I'm sure we are all familiar with. This is the model where we have a nucleus with protons and neutrons and surrounding that nucleus, circling around the nucleus are some electrons. Now this is not really a very good model. The best thing that this model does is it shows us how many protons and how many neutrons and how many electrons are in the atom. And in this case, we've got, we've got how many? One, two, three, four, five, six protons six neutrons and six electrons. So the six protons is, are telling us that this is a carbon atom. Those six neutrons are telling us that this is a carbon-12 atom, which is the most common isotope of carbon. And the six electrons are there to match the six protons so that this is a neutral carbon atom. Protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, equal numbers of each means that the charges cancel out and it's a neutrally charged atom. This is not a good model, mostly because of the way the electrons are depicted. They don't really orbit like that. They actually take up discrete energy levels surrounding the nucleus, and these ener different energy levels where the electrons exist are called the electron shells. Now this model right here is showing us the nucleus and then various different levels of energy where electrons can exist. Each one of these levels is called, is called a shell. Each shell represents a very specific energy level, and electrons in that particular shell can only have that specific energy. The shells that are closest to the nucleus, like this one designated K, is the, is the shell closest to the nucleus. It has the lowest energy level, and as the shells move out, they increase in energy. Each shell can only hold a certain number of electrons and that is determined by this equation here, 2n squared, where n is the shell number, and so we can use that to calculate how many electrons would be in each shell. So in this first shell, n is equal to 1, 2 times 1 squared is 2. In the second shell, shell number 2, 2 times 2 squared would gives us 8. The third shell, 2 times 3 squared gives us 18, etc. The total number of electrons around an atom is determined by the number of protons in the atom because for any particular atom, protons and neutrons are typically going to be equal in number to cancel out to give a, to give a neutrally charged atom. And of course, the number of protons in the atom determines what the atom actually is. So if you know the atomic number of the atom, which is the proton number, then you know how many electrons are going to be in these electron shells. And they're going to start filling. The first two will go in in the first shell here, and then the next eight in the second shell, the next 18 in the third shell, etc. And they're going to build from the inside going out. Uh, the inside being the lowest energy level. But under, under some circumstances, though, electrons can move from one shell, one electron shell, to another. To move from a lower energy shell to a higher energy shell, energy has to be added to that atom somehow. Uh, a, a typical way that might ha be happen is just from thermal energy but the, the amount of energy that must be added is going to be equal to the energy difference between the two shells. To move from a higher energy shell to a lower energy shell, energy is going to be released, and the amount of energy released, again, is going to be equal to the amount of energy difference between the two shells. So each, the, the important thing to take away from here is that each shell represents a discrete energy level. An important term to, to understand is the valence shell, and the valence shell is the outer shell that has electrons in it. So let's take a look at a few electron shell configurations. Uh, one thing that should be pointed out is that these models only represent the energy levels and don't represent the way the electrons are actually distributed in each one of the shells. So for example, in the first shell, the electrons are not orbit opposite each other, the electrons are actually in, in, an electron, in an electron cloud, which I'll show you what they look like in a second. So the bottom line is these, these uh, models are only to show numbers of electrons in a particular shell, not the, not the specific way that they're distributed. So copper is element number 29, and there are 29 electrons in copper, two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, 
18 in the third shell and then one electron in the valence shell. Argon is element number 18 with two electrons in shell one, eight in shell two, and then eight in the third shell. And silicon is, is element number 14. So it has 14 electrons, two electrons in the inner shell, the first shell, eight in the second shell, and then four in the third shell. And I picked these three elements because copper is a good conductor, argon is a good insulator, and silicon is a semiconductor. And we'll talk about those three different types of elements in a sec. Now, I'm not gonna go very much into electron subshells. I only wanted to put this up here just to show you the way that electrons are actually distributed in a, around the, the nucleus in an atom. So we won't be concerned about subshells at all, but it's interesting to know how electrons are actually distributed around the nucleus. Okay, insulators are insulators because the electrons are held onto very tightly by the atom. When a shell is full, Elect the atoms are typically in a very stable state. They don't like to let go of the, of the electrons. And so all of these have full shells, full inner shells, as well as full valence shells. And because of that, the electrons are held onto very tightly. They don't like to release them. Therefore, there are no free electrons for conducting, or very few free electrons for, for uh, allowing a current to flow. That's, that's what makes insulators good insulators. There's no free electrons available from the element. On the other hand, conductors are good conductors because they have an electron in the valence shell, typically just a single electron in the valence shell, that is held onto very loosely. In fact, you could say it's not really even tied to the, uh, the atom itself. It's, very, it's free to move around, so if you apply an electric field, the electron is going to move along with, that, with the electric field. It takes very little energy to pull that electron away. And since that free electron would become a charge carrier, elements with one electron in the valence shell, like these ones, are going to be very good conductors. All of the elements that you see here, all of the atoms that you see here, only have a single electron in the valence shell. So this makes them all good conductors. Semiconductors are in the middle. They typically have approximately half full valence shell. The carbon, silicon, and germanium that you see here have exactly half full. They have four electrons in their valence shell. And semiconductors like to form crystalline structures by sharing electrons between the atoms. And what this does is it creates sort of, sort of a full valence shell by the sharing of electrons. Each atom contributes four electrons of its own to the valence shell, but then it borrows one or shares one from each of four surrounding electrons. So from the sharing of electrons from surrounding atoms, this crystalline structure is created and you get, a, you get basically full valence shells. And since the valence shell is, in a way, full, there are very few free electrons, and so semiconductors are actually not very conductive at all. The difference is it actually does not take a whole lot of energy to remove one of these electrons from the valence shell and, push it, and put it into, in, into a state where it can conduct. And since that energy can come in the form of thermal energy, which is just heat, as you increase the thermal energy or you increase the temperature of semiconductors, they actually become more conductive because more of the electrons that are in the valence shells can get pushed into the conduction band, it's called, and so that they can become pretty good or, or better conductors as heat goes up. Atoms are pretty much never found individually. They're typically with a bunch of other atoms or molecules of the same type like in a metal wire or a lump of glass or a crystal of silicon. And when a large number of atoms are together, the outermost shells become merged, providing greater number of energy level, uh, a greater number of energy levels for those electrons to exist in. So this is showing a single atom, so it just has this one single band to exist in. But if you have five atoms close together, then, then you've got several different really close but not identical energy levels. And then if you have t lots and lots of atoms together, then you've got a huge number of different but really close together energy levels that, that the electrons can exist in. And what this does is it creates an energy band. It's not just a single level, it's now a, a, band, a band of levels. So this band here is the merging of all the valence shells of the atoms that, that are in, in this element. And the merging of these bands or the merging of these shells creates the band in this, in this case, this would be the valence band. 
at some energy level above the valence band is the conduction band. And this is the band of energy in which electrons are free to move around and they're no longer bound to the atom, but they're, they're free to move around and, 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 and allow conduction to occur. The amount of energy between the valence band and the conduction band is what determines how good of a conductor your, your element or your, your substance is. In the case of conductors, the valence band and the conduction band overlap. In the case of things that are not so good conductors, the valence band will still be created from these multitudes of atoms in close proximity, but there's going to be a gap that those, there's still going to be a gap that those electrons have to overcome to move into the conduction band. And it's a, it's a significant leap that's required for an electron to enter the conduction band when you're dealing with an insulator. Now this slide shows the difference between insulators, semiconductors, and conductors. And really what it is, is the difference in energy between the valence band and the conduction band. Valence band, conduction band, valence band, conduction band. For a good insulator, that energy gap is pretty big, typically more than five electron volts for a, an electron to get from the valence band up into the conduction band. And it takes a lot of energy for that to happen, and typically very few electrons in a conductor, or very few electrons in a insulator are able to get from that valence band into the conduction band. Not very many free charge carriers in the conduction band makes the element or the, the substance a good insulator, poor conductor. In semiconductors, it doesn't take quite as much energy for electrons to get from the valence band into the conduction band. Typically for silicon, it's about 1.1 electron volts, and for germanium, it's about 0.67 electron volts for an electron to get from the valence band up into the con conduction band. And at ordinary room temperatures, that thermal energy is sufficient to get a number of electrons to jump. And that's what makes semiconductors better conductors than insulators. For conductors, the overlapping valence and conduction bands make them excellent conductors. And that electron that is in the outer shell, the valence shell of, of things like gold, silver, and copper, is free to drift between the valence band and the conduction band, and that's what makes those kinds of elements really good conductors. So this was a really brief overview of atomic theory with a tiny bit of quantum physics where we talked about the different energy levels that, that electrons can exist in, and hopefully this gives you a bit of an idea of of why there is that difference between conductors, semiconductors, and insulators, and provides a, a good background so that we can really get into the discussion of how semiconductors operate. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.